Uh, good morning slash afternoon, everyone. I'm Corby Cummer from the Aspen Institute and the Atlantic, and I, uh, uh, I run the Food and Policy, Food and Society program at the Aspen Institute with Dan Glickman. Dan Glickman is the eminence and mastermind between many important and good things that happen at the Institute. In fact, let's just say everything good and important that happens at the Aspen Institute, except for some members of the audience, um, and is, is my guiding force. But we also have with us Dan Glickman, as you all know, as a former Secretary of Agriculture. He'll be speaking this afternoon about SNAP with his fellow former Secretary, Ann Veneman and others, and you want to hear that, that's at what time, Dan? Madeline Albright. Right here, so you'll yeah. uh, want to hear that about SNAP, and um, I'll, we'll be talking about SNAP later. And we also, with us, somebody I'm thrilled to meet, Ndidi Muneli from Lagos in Nigeria, grew up in Nigeria, and I am the lucky uh, reader of her Wikipedia page, which is Fabulous, in which you read of her um, distinguished educator parents in Nigeria who met at Cornell here in 1965 and went back to Nigeria to help Nigeria and raised their five children to do the same thing. Um, and even in times of stress and no money, uh, largely because of government policies, at family holidays they would help people who had less than they did. So she grew up with this um, service and social service ethic, uh, deeply ingrained in her family, and came to Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and then slummed at Harvard Business School, <laughs> um, and uh, has become, uh, and worked at McKinsey, and it has, um, I mean, a wildly impressive resume, but like her parents, she has gone back to help Nigeria. Uh, and we'll be talking today uh, specifically about food ventures in Nigeria, but there's a great deal else she does to help women, to help women entrepreneurs, to help women in Africa. Um, and I would like to begin with talking about the, uh, for, I mean, the staggering statistic about Nigeria. You all know, as I did not, that um, by 2050, Nigeria is going to be the third most populous country in the world. Goodbye, United States. So from its current population of 200 to 450 million, how is the food supply going to meet the demand? And how is it meeting it now? So could you bring us up to the picture of the agriculture production you found in Nigeria and what you wanted to do to help it out? And there are plenty of chairs interspersed uh, in here if people want to stand. So. And we're talking Nigeria. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity and the very warm introduction. So Nigeria, as we mentioned, is 200 million people, 60% work in agriculture. Um, and unfortunately, we still import 90% of the processed food we consume in the country. We're a net importer of food. And the main reason are, is really driven by two things. Number one is that relative to other world regions, we still have very low yields, driven to a large extent by a dependency on rain-fed agriculture, where we have limited irrigation, limited improved seeds. Um, and the second is that we have high rates of post-harvest losses. Um, 40 to 60% of our fruits and vegetables go to waste. And then for grains, 20 to 30%. So that's 40% in Nigeria, the same food waste figure that we're facing in the United States. Exactly, exactly. So in 2010, my husband and I started two companies, Ace Foods, which is an agro-processing company. And our vision was really to source locally, process for the local market, displace imports, and prove that we could create proudly Nigerian products that could compete. And today we work with 10,000 farmers. We source a range of produce, and we produce spices, complementary foods, and breakfast cereals. Through Sahel Consulting, we are unlocking the potential in the dairy industry, in a lot of roots and tuber value chains like yam and cassava, and demonstrating that we can feed ourselves. So entrepreneurship is key to transforming the agriculture sector in and, Nigeria. And can we drill down on some of this? That you were finding that despite 60% of the population being involved in agriculture, that so many of the international food companies, you sit on the board of Nestle, but there are many other very active international food conglomerates, were importing the food that they brought to Nigeria, even if it was being grown in Nigeria. Why? Well, I think a lot of multinationals find the easy way out. 
import and repackage instead of investing in the country. Their argument is usually that they cannot find consistent high quality supply. But it's a chicken and egg question, which one comes first? You have to invest in sourcing locally to prove to the farmer that you're going to be there for the long term so that they can make the right investments themselves. Um, and so we're seeing some changes, but there's definitely a policy dimension. Unless you incentivize companies to source locally, they will not. And unless you can provide com a competitive local alternative, that also propels them to do so. And I sit on the board of Heineken and I mentioned it's a beer company, but they use cassava to make beer in Nigeria. And that was a commitment to say, we're gonna innovate. Instead of importing malted barley, we're going to figure out how to make cassava and use cassava starch to make beer. And Nestle does the same with soy and maize and a lot of other products as well. And so did they find you, or when you were looking for customers for your business, did you find the companies that were committed to in-country sourcing? So it was very difficult in the beginning. Uh, we started with a range of other products, jams and pepper sauces, and ended up with spices. And our biggest spice consumers are the noodle companies. I don't know how many of you know about instant noodles, but they're very popular yeah, in Asia like and out. Africa. <laughs> and, and now they're being consumed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're not very healthy. But we, wanted, we realized that we needed to grow quickly, and we started with business-to-business -business sales. So we went to the noodle companies. They have spice sachets in their noodles, and we basically said, you're importing the spices. Let's prove to you that we can supply high-quality alternatives locally. And gradually, we've displaced some of their imports. Um, and that was a starting point. Then we went to the fast food companies and did the same thing. And over time, we're able to build enough volume to start selling retail ourselves. Um, and so now we're in um, all the major retail channels and in at least 10 states. And we've exported to the Netherlands and the United States. So there's progress. So you started as business to business. And what besides spice sachets? And also, I wonder if you could give us more of a range. You've mentioned cassava and spices that are, that are big, grown in Nigeria. What are other kind of underused resources? And tell us the, the yam example. Okay. So actually, Nigeria is the largest producer of cassava and yam in the world, second largest of cashew, and sesame, fourth largest producer in the world. So if you get a bun, uh, one out of four chances, it will be a Nigerian um, sesame. Uh, um, we also produce um, lots of cocoa. And then I mentioned yam because I don't know how many of you have eaten yam, but it's a large, big brown tuber. Um, and it's highly profitable and one of the main um, cultural dominant uh, crops. Sadly, and I mentioned food fraud earlier when we were talking, Nigeria grows yam, but it's still rain dependent, and our, 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 we could generate a lot more yields. Now, we actually have people processing yam because the waste is 40 to 60 percent, and yet we have imported potato flour from America being labeled as yam flour, competing against the local uh, produce. So you have so much complexity around food systems that are broken that link us in, in Nigeria to the United States um, and just demonstrate how connected we are as countries. The same with soy. We import 40% of the soy we use in Nigeria from the United States. Um, and so the soy lobby is very active in Nigeria. You mean the U.S. soy the lobby? The U.S. soy lobby, yeah. And do you try to, um, I wouldn't say fight that, but do you try to provide a Nigerian alternative? Well, Nigerian soy is actually very high quality. Um, and so what we're trying to do is increase the yields of farmers and compete in price-wise so that we can ensure that um, if, I don't if people fall have to... Off this chair, <laughs> yeah. I think that you want to hold Oh, yeah. So this is one of our products. Show and tell. It's called soy maize, and it's a CSV fortified with vitamins and minerals. It's a complete meal, which we offer to fight moderate malnutrition. And I was mentioning that uh, we compete against some of the World Food Program imports. Um, driven by the countries that s support the World Food Program, who would rather they import the produce from those countries instead of supporting Nigerian farmers. So the current, and we'll be talking about this with Dan too, the, the paradox that uh, countries produce so much that in your case are not consumed within Nigeria, but also that the world at the moment uh, produces more than enough food to feed the world, but Distrib distribution, equitable distribution, efficient, safe distribution, those are the real problems. So as you're thinking of the more than doubling of the population in 30 or 40 years, what are you thinking are the big obstacles? And, and, how, and how are you helping fix that, huh? 
So there are a lot of obstacles. I would say that the first one is ensuring that we can produce enough food to feed our people. Um, and it's not just a Nigeria phenomenon, it's an Africa-wide phenomenon. Only three countries right now will be able to feed its population by 2050, even if we increase yields by 80%. So we're going to have to quadruple yields. And that means that we need innovation around seed systems, fertilizer, crop management, disease control, and um, pest control. The second thing is around food waste. We need to process. We need greater linkages between farmers and food processors. And we need a commitment to nutritious food and the production of nutritious food. And then the third one is around policies. We really need a level playing field between our countries. Unfortunately, there are quite destructive policies that are made in Europe that affect us in Africa or made in the United States that affect us as well. And I would say that it's really important when we develop these policies, and those of you who are at the helm of developing these policies always think about the short and long-term implications on many, many stakeholders, including the farmers themselves. And then finally, I mentioned food fraud. I think that we're con connected and food systems are connected globally. And unless we have strong institutions that ensure standards, we're going to dump a lot of fake food in countries and that has um, really a de devastating effect. We're seeing ri rising cancer rates in many parts of the world linked to food fraud. And I think we need to ensure that standards do not decline as we try to produce cheaper food for people. Wonderful. Yeah. We, you, can you bring this into an international context? And you've been busily making notes. Well, first of all, you have the future of the world right here. Right here. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So I think, I think I, you're I, in agreement I'm for, about I'm that. for her for Secretary General of the UN, ahead of the, <laughs> the World Food Program, and other kinds of things. So I'm going to take you a little bit on a, on a, like a 30,000 foot level. And I, I, I say to myself, what are the asteroids <clears throat> that are out there that could come and hit the Earth and could really impact food security and feeding a hungry world. Now, there is some good news. That is, the number of people who are in a famine situation, notwithstanding the terrible things that are happening in Yemen and, and other parts of the world, has actually gotten a little bit better in the last few years. Uh, uh, part of it is food distribution techniques have gotten better, and, and uh, part of it is, is that the Europeans have become much more engaged, Chinese are much more involved, and I'll talk about that for a moment. But here are what I see some of the asteroids are, and they affect Nigeria as well as anyone else. One, the demographic bulge. We are gradually creating a massive number of people under the age of 20 who, if they're not fed or if they don't have a job, and m many of these are in smallholder agriculture, will either move to the cities, try to uh, cross the Mediterranean, and uh, will become a great opportunity for political instability in the world. So the, the, when you hear about this demographic bulge, it has great impact in terms of feeding a hungry world, particularly in developing area. The second is climate and weather. So no industry is more impacted by climate change than agriculture. Why? It's simple. It's outside. <laughs> and, uh, and, and by the way, the Department of Agriculture owns most of this land you see around you. It's leased to private uh, contractors who run the ski resorts. And, and, but uh, the USDA Forest Service is the owner of most of these lands. And, and it's, climate change is impacting even uh, the growth of uh, forestry and trees as well. The third is nutrition and health. So this is a health conference. It's really important that we're having this conversation. But for the most of the last 50 years, what you eat has been a very low priority for people in the health world. Doctors generally don't, uh, aren't trained in it. Uh, medical professionals don't think it's important. And you're treated when you're either about to die or very sick. And the prevention uh, options are not there. And that's why the quality of food and, and what is served is so important. And not just in the United States, where it's a serious problem, but particularly important in the developing world where you need a combination of of uh, proteins and carbohydrates and other things and nutrients in order to prevent stunting and because Nigeria is a country with a lot of stunting, but so is Guatemala and Honduras and other places like that. The fourth issue is governance and corruption. If you have a corrupt government or corrupt institutions, it, it makes it impossible to try to get into a situation where you can develop the kind of strategies that you've done for, to, to in, in create entrepreneurship that makes a big difference. Um, and by the way, this is one of the reasons why 
American engagement is so important in the world. It's not that we're totally indispensable, because I don't believe that. But uh, recent foreign policy initiatives, which seem to pull the United States back out of de democracy building and, and helping people, is, is really very dangerous, not only to our country, but for the rest of the world. Quickly, uh, a few other things. You talked about post-harvest loss. We throw away about 30% of the food in the world. We throw away 30% of the food in the United States. And, and it's not as if we're throwing it away because uh, we're hungry. Either it's, uh, we don't have the systems in place. It's getting a little bit better. Uh, but as an affluent country, it's disgraceful that we throw away. But in the developing world, post-harvest loss is caused by a lot of other things. Corruption, lack of refrigeration, lack of electricity. Uh, you know, all these kinds of things that uh, uh, make it very, very difficult for uh, people to become involved in agriculture. Uh, the, 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 the next to the last thing has to do with humanitarian roles. So there's two things here, can we feed the world? The first is develop self-sufficiency so uh, people like my colleague on the left are able to develop uh, uh, businesses and, and, and entrepreneurial activities where you have self sustained growth of food production in their own country. It makes a huge difference. Uh, but we also have an obligation to feed people who are in famine situations and in hunger. The United States is the largest contributor to the World Food Program, which is the largest charity in the world feeding people. It's part of the United Nations. And we can't withdraw from that effort, no matter you know, how we believe uh, uh, different perspectives are in terms of feeding the world. And the final thing I want to talk about is science and technology. And I may be an outlier here, okay, but the his history of agriculture his, for the last 500 years has been based on new techniques and not afraid to go to the future and develop alternatives to find ways to produce better crops, better yields, fight pests and disease, use less water producing crops. And a lot of that means technologies that are very, very controversial, including genetic engineering and CRISPR technology and GMOs and other things. And I recognize that they all have to be well studied and the academic world has to recognize that um, uh, just because uh, a plant grows faster doesn't necessarily mean it's safer. But we cannot feed a hungry world without using science. And right now, the United States spends less money on public research than China does. That's a big change over the last 30 or 40 years. And Brazil is almost caught up with us in terms of public research, meaning government research and, and related land-grant college research. And so, so there, there is a, a move in the world, because the Europeans are kind of been a leading a part of this, and in our country, to try to resist looking at science is a way to help us to deal with feeding a hungry world. And in my opinion, you can't do it without having an open mind on, on the use of science and science techniques. Ironically, people do not object to genetically modified insulin or things that keep you alive in terms if you have cancer or heart disease. When it comes to food, there is a difference of opinion here for some reason. Maybe it's because for a lot of people, food is holy, it's sacred, it's part of our culture. Uh, we don't want to muck around with uh, maybe what God created and, and those kinds of things. But, but I, I repeat that because I, I think it's really important as we feed a hungry world, science has to be part of that effort. I'll close with those remarks. Well, thank you, because Dan is going to give the opening uh, talk at a series of convenings the Food and Society Program is doing on gene editing. So I'm awfully glad yeah. that you teed that up, uh, Dan. Um, you know, so much of what Dan just brought up were things I was going to ask you. And I know you have the answers to everything because you're going to run the world. So um, <laughs> we're looking to you to answer all questions. But so much of what you talked about with the problems that you and your husband and your colleagues are addressing in Nigeria are practical problems. It's solving problems of distribution, more efficiency in the systems that are already in place. You said, to my surprise, if I understood you right, that water is not the looming crisis in Nigeria. It is for other parts of Africa, for other parts of the world. So 
how crucial do you think in the next two decades it is to look at science and technology? Um, or are you, do you think that trying to work with these very pragmatic, on-the-ground solutions to current systems will help get Nigeria a long way where it needs to be by that uh, 2050 time? No, I definitely think science and technology is critical. Um, I recently uh, wrote about this, I mentioned, um, because I feel that a lot of the focus in many of our countries is really on survival as opposed to thinking through the long term. Climate change is affecting us. Water is a problem in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in most of the countries around the Nile, including Egypt. And so those are all critical issues. We're having later rains, more flooding, so we need seas that can adapt to drought, et cetera. Now, the challenge with many of our institutions, and in West Africa alone, we have 60 research institutions, and over a billion dollars spent funding them every year is that these institutions are not demand driven. So they don't ask the private sector, what are your problems, what are your challenges? In Many, West Africa. In West Africa, many of the scientists are driven by their own interests, which is great. And I know many of you are scientists here, but the truth is it has to be demand and market driven. What are the needs of the community? What are the needs of the private actors? And we can actually get the private sector in Africa to fund this research. Um, I recently visited Australia and looked at the example of Embrapa in Brazil. And in both countries that are net exporters of food, they figured out a way to get the private sector to pay. In Australia, for example, for wheat research, every time there's a new variety and they can get new demand for it from Asia, at the point of export, a levy is imposed on the farmers to pay for that research, which goes back into the kitty. The same happens in Cote d'Ivoire with cocoa research. And I think we need to see more of these examples being replicated all over Africa. So I'm a big believer in science and technology. I work a lot with biofortified crops. I'm not, as I mentioned to you, convinced about GMO for every single crop. And I think we need to do a little more testing. But biofortification through Harvest Plus has worked and is working in, in Africa around cassava, around orange fleshy potato, biofortified uh, beans, um, vitamin A maize, which addresses the vitamin A deficiencies in our now, communities. Now remind us what biofortification means. So biofortification is basically saying we're going to use natural methods to find out how we can extract vitamin A from an existing crop and infuse it into another one, in the case of vitamin A, so that it, it's, there's an overabundance in one crop. So cassava ordinarily does not have a lot of vitamin A. We need vitamin A in cassava because cassava is consumed widely by people as, for, as a staple. Now, how can we extract that particular uh, vitamin that we need and how can we overcompensate in the next uh, options that we create as opposed to the gene modification. It's a slight nuance. Well, I, I just want to say, I do think that the agriculture and food industry has often oversold the value of GMOs because it hasn't really had a, a consumer benefit that they've seen. In some cases, you could use less water, but it mostly has to do with using certain pesticides that a lot of these companies also sell. Uh, I've said if they could develop a, a, a genetically modified orange that would allow people like me to grow hair, it would sell like wildfire. You know, we're not quite there yet with the consumer uh, uh, be benefits from it. But there's certainly great value to be earned by biofortification as well. And is this is this biofortified in any way? No, it's not. It's just soybeans and corn. Fortified with vitamins and minerals. We call it maize in Nigeria, but it's corn uh, in America. Yeah, when, when it's, and when it's it, a complete meal. When, <laughs> when, it, when it said soya maize, I thought, are you disguising soy as corn by calling it soy maize? <laughs> and in fact, it's a combination of the, of the two. But what about getting food? So we didn't talk in our, in our uh, fascinating uh, preliminary talk, but we didn't talk about uh, economic inequality and the inequality of food distribution and nutrition, which is a big Dan Glickman uh, field you'll be hearing about this afternoon at three. But what about income distribution in Nigeria and how you're, you're working to fix it since you're fixing everything? So right now, 57% of household income in Nigeria is spent on food. Um, and that's because we're starting from a very low base. When 70% of the population lives on $2 a day, you have a low base. However, in many communities that can grow their own food, we don't see the high rates of malnutrition that we see in a lot of urban communities where there's what we call hidden hunger. 
And with urbanization increasing, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world, you have a lot more poverty in urban communities where they cannot grow their own food and they're dependent on the noodles that I talked about earlier. Because it's cheap, it's easy, it's convenient. And so we need, as people in the health space, as well as entrepreneurs in agriculture, to think about what we can do to be catalytic in order to create incentives and create low-cost meals that are nutritious. And so in a lot of African countries, there's a big push around nutrition-sensitive agriculture. So you're not just pushing improved yields for corn if the corn is not nutritious on its own. Um, so we, we, we need to think about those high-value superfoods, I think they call them in America, that can, can also be replicated um, in many other countries and done quite cheaply. And I just want to uh, parallel this. So I've served on the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on non-communicable diseases in the developing world. So th th these were not diseases like uh, infectious diseases like malaria or tuberculosis. These were diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart disease. And so it was a big panel of very brilliant people, much smarter than me. Uh, Not and, possible. Yeah, it was. And, and, you know, public health specialists. And so they came up with a report, and the primary report had to do with more research, generally, smoking cessation, great idea, and getting more pharmaceutical products into the developing world. So I raised my hand and I said, you know, my mother used to tell me, you are what you eat. And I said, most of these diseases, like type 2 diabetes, which the fastest rate of growth in the world is in the developing world, or heart disease, are and, and, and they're, they're what you call environmental factors. They're either eating improperly or not exercising or maybe unsanitary water type of conditions. And I said, I won't sign the report. It, you know, you're not talking about something that impacts people's lives. Well, as it turns out, we worked it out and the report went out. And when they shopped the report around the country, the primary question people asked about was nutrition. I mean, people know that tobacco is terrible for you. It's inherently bad. And, but food is a much more complicated issue because, you know, one Coca-Cola is not going to kill you. One an hour is probably not a good idea. And in the developing world, uh, Western food is now becoming much, much more prevalent. And this is another problem that you have, and this is why the issues of, of nutrition and health and medicine all and agriculture all relate to each other. So, Dan, um, those of us at the Aspen Institute who work with you know that you would never actually say, I will not sign that document. You would find a way of making people yeah. think that they thought of the fix you wanted right. them to think There's of. There's a Corby Cummer and style of leadership. Then right? you would sign it. Um, but getting uh, sticking to nutrition, I happen to be in possession of... Um, a paper that you are a co-signer of, along with two former secretaries of agriculture, that talks about nutritional quality in SNAP. And I know that you'll be talking about this uh, later today, but can you talk about the necessity of building into food assistance really around the world and thinking in terms of nutritional quality when we're offering food assistance? Well, SNAP, as some of you know, is the food stamp program. It's, the, it's called Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And, I always thought it was strange because the N in SNAP was the least important part of it, uh, you know. And so we've been trying to do what we can to see if we can upgrade diet quality as, as part of SNAP. And actually the World Food Program has try, been trying to do the same thing with global food and, and hunger. And, and, but, but what is fascinating about it is what we, the studies that we've shown is, is, is that, uh, that uh, in the developing world, especially when... Um, uh, women and girls feel safe, and uh, where uh, cooking uh, local products are are available to them, you actually have find a much higher nutritional uh, quality than you often find in the developed world. And I think we can learn something from each other. It's not just the U.S. telling you all how to eat. I mean, uh, that's probably uh, the, the studies show that's not necessarily the best thing to do. I'm glad to have written the first book in English on the slow food movement, which is all about this kind of cross-country exchange. And Didi, is this a concern in Nigeria? It definitely is a concern. And I was just going to say, about a month ago, Krispy Kreme arrived in Lagos. Oh. It's a much fun fanfare. But I think there's Listen a sense... Listen to that <laughs> reaction. Wow, we're an aware audience. So I, I actually think that the burden is not just on the developing world, but also the developed world. I hate that term, sorry. I'll say the, the West and the South. The whole concept of 
having double standards. So they have sugar taxes in Europe. And, and you know, the same large Pepsi and Coca-Cola are doing very well in our countries uh, with the population bulge and this new consumers. You know, a lot of American companies and other European companies are experiencing extremely uh, double-digit growth and lots of profitability, selling what they cannot sell in many parts of the world to us. And I think all of you who have a seat at the table can also ensure that we have this level playing field. Why should African children have more sugar in their Coca-Cola than US children or in their cereal or whatever? So I think I would put, I would challenge you all to think about how, what role you can play in ensuring that there is a level playing field because every human life counts. And do you have a government agency, for example, that's saying, um, you who are relying on instant noodles are getting much too much salt. Stop this, you know, in a way that uh, your country people would, would actually listen to? So I think we, we, we have the equivalent of the FDA called NAFDAQ and then the Standards Organization of Nigeria. So they do have standards. But the challenge is enforcement. In many cases where you have weak institutions around legislature, and, um, enforcement is not where it needs to be. The challenge for me is that these organizations also, um, they regulate my company as well. So I'm very careful about, <laughs> about being off the record. Please, nobody should post this. Um, but the truth is that we need stronger institutions. We need stronger labs. We need stronger uh, investment in research and development. But we also need the countries that are exporting. I mentioned the food fraud earlier. A lot of it is coming from China and India. And I've, I've, I've challenged the governments of those countries to also stop it at source. If you can stop it before it gets to our country, it helps us a lot. And you also should not have those double standards for any citizen of any country. Uh, we couldn't agree more. Part of your world leadership role that we agree with. Um, Dan, or either of you, we don't want to neglect small subjects like uh, China and South Asia. When uh, we talk about the food supply and challenges, you've recently been to Austra uh, Australia. You've looked at their challenges. and. Dan, you wanted to uh, talk a bit about South Asia. So compared to the context we've been talking about, do you see other asteroids? Well, uh, you know, one asteroid is, of course, is, uh, we're talking right about now in terms of the tariff and trade issues, is what is the role of China in terms of its relationship with the world in terms of products generally. But China is now becoming... Uh, a, a very strong competitor of the United States in food as well as anything else. They just bought uh, Syngenta, which is the, one of the largest seed companies in the world. Chem China did that. And uh, China buys about 40% of the soybeans in the world. And uh, it's interesting to note if we get into a trade war with China, the people who are I can't imagine what makes you think I don't might. know, and I don't know who's, who's even <laughs> talked about that. But I do know that if it happens, the great beneficiary will be other countries selling soybeans, particularly Brazil, which is uh, now, uh, they're the largest seller right now, soybeans to Brazil. So, but, but, you know, the Chinese are going through their own difficulties with food safety. You know, China's had this huge population migration away from small farms into cities, and mm -hmm. they've, they've had to manage that politically, which has been very, very difficult for them to do. I don't think China's our enemy, we have grown to rely on China as a massive source of imports for the United States because we sell them a lot more than they sell us, partly in, the, in terms of how they treat our products from a tariff perspective. And but, now they're outsourcing their pork production. They're the world's largest pork consumers to us by buying Smithfield and... And, and uh, f you know, we're not going to be the king of the hill forever. I, I, but, I, but I do think, I want to just raise this point, this doesn't raise directly to you, is... For the United States to in, disengage, um, America first, uh, this really has a profound implication on a lot of industries, but particularly agriculture. And uh, we export about 60% of our products overseas. Without that, you have vast areas of America who will be hurt very, very significantly because of that. So I just make that point. Thank as well. you. I invite you to consider questions because in about one and a half minutes, a one minute, uh, we're going to invite the questions. But uh, I didn't want to leave since you've do, doing so much for Nigeria and you present such a nuanced picture of Nigeria. I wonder if you could uh, 
bring us into the picture of challenges you see in African countries around you that are different from Nigeria's? Well, I would say that there's a lot of hope and there's, there's been tremendous progress around innovation. Um, a country like Ethiopia has really demonstrated in the last 10 years well, how you can transform agriculture. Um, and they have a fantastic commodity exchange, which has been copied across the continent, uh, which links farmers directly to uh, mar markets across the globe that buy coffee and tea and other produce. Um, Rwanda is also showing tremendous progress. Um, and I think that countries like South Africa have been net exporters of food for a while. But Cote d'Ivoire is, for me, an example of what, how you can turn around a situation with cocoa. They've actually demonstrated a lot of responsibility and, and challenged some of the large multinationals like Mars and others, and are now partnering with them to do the right thing around uh, cocoa production yeah, and the processing Mars within the country. The partnership is it's a fantastic. fascinating case study. So I think there are a lot of bright spots, and I see innova innovators. We have, uh, I talked about Hello Tractor, which started in Nigeria, which is Uber of tractors, which is doing really well. We have crowdfunding um, for agriculture. So I see a lot of the great excitement that we see in innovation here being replicated on the agricultural landscape in Africa. And I think we have a lot to teach the world. By the way, cell service in Africa is much better than it is in the United States because they've built cell towers yeah. everywhere. And you get a, call, a telephone call from Africa, and it's like next door. Whereas here, you got to hang up, walk outside, go to that corner <laughs> of the building. And farmers yeah. are using a lot of this technology um, to improve their yields and their livelihoods. So. Yeah, and when I so many things like cell phone towers, Africa can leap ahead of us, including the idea of Uber Tractor. When I said to Dan, "Is that a great idea? Why doesn't that exist here?" He said, "Of course it exists here. Americans like owning their own jalopy tractors." and they don't want to innovate or, or change their, their ways. We have questions over here, and are we having a mic runner? So could you come right to the front? And uh, since I see two here, the woman in pink. I'm going to speak to you both. Thank you for a great presentation for all that you're doing. Um, I wonder if both of you could speak to um, industrial animal agriculture and the demand for meat growing in places like China, since you raised it. Um, already starting to outstrip supply, putting enormous pressure on these systems, and these systems in turn putting huge pressure on water supply and, and pollution and, and so on and so forth, um, as well as, of course, spread of disease, bird flu, mad, mad cow, et cetera. So how are you thinking through those issues in regards to your work? Okay, well, uh, boy, I tell you, that question is so complicated, it take an hour to answer it, but I'll say the following thing. One is, it, the human being, at least for the last 15, 20,000 years, has been a pro, has had protein, primarily a protein-based diet. In the United States, half of the gross proceeds of agriculture are livestock. So this is a big part of American agriculture. And much of the corn and soybeans that are grown, they're not grown for corn on the cob. They're grown to feed animals. Okay. So... But the other side of the coin is, and one of the, by the way, one of the reasons why it has our, our farm programs, because our farm programs historically have made it difficult to grow non-program crops, which means vegetables and fruits, on program crop acreage, like wheat and corn, because if you did that, you'd lose all your benefits from your wheat and corn. Okay, imagine that. So, uh, but th those are changing now, and, and the, the, the laws are getting a, a little bit better. And uh, the diets are changing as people begin to look at issues like type 2 diabetes and, and other physical diseases, uh, cholesterol-based diseases and others, where a more comp complex diet is, is necessary. I can't talk about all the things you raised because you raised a good question. I would have to say there was one, it was either H.L. Mencken or somebody who once said that for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. And I think there are too many people in the food industry who see it, get the GMOs out, stop eating meat, you know, when in fact that, that's, that, that, those things are probably not going to happen. But we can do things to make our food safer and better. Uh, and, and, and we can get the medical profession much more engaged in the production of food than we have before. I think we have some of its members in our audience. Yeah. So you have been charged. Did you... What we see in, in my part of the world is that with the increased growth in demand for poultry and beef, crops are, there's higher demand for the same crops and the prices of the corn and maize for human consumption is rising. Yeah. And so the challenge for us is how can we 
increase yields, but also find alternatives for the um, poultry. So we're actually looking at waste and how we can use waste. So there's need for innovation. So for example, they're using cassava peels to feed cows, um, as opposed to corn um, and silage and other things. So basically looking at other uses and how we can transform waste into feed. And I think that's where the research institutions come in again, as where the social entrepreneurs need to work. And an unusual aspect of this product is it has two crops on it that are going to be consumed by humans knowingly, uh, since most of the production goes to animal feed and or in products hidden in, in various uh, industrial additives that people don't know. Uh, Daryl Burton, Phoenix, Arizona. I just wanted to go to one of your original points where you're saying the population of Nigeria seems to be doomed to be 400 to 450 million, and global populations are shrinking, and including in some African countries. And I'm just wondering, is Nigeria really doomed to that population number? And is that, to, mm -hmm. is that going to, is there a hope that that will not happen? Yeah, so I think there's definitely a place for education, and the education of women in particular. Um, family planning and all of the different initiatives that are ongoing. Um, the challenge still remains though that in both Niger and Nigeria, the average woman still has six children. And one of the reasons for that, if you ask her, is that some of them will die. Um, and so the challenge for us, and that's why this is such a fun, fantastic conference, is to think <laughs> about how we can enhance the you know, life expectancy of a lot of our children. Um, and I know many of you are working on that and at the cutting edge of that. So we'll continue to work at all different dimensions to ensure that we do not get to 450 million. But some of us also see it as an asset, right? In some way, a big population, if you can handle it, is an asset. It depends on whether you're able to feed them, educate them, provide for them, and ensure that they live full and meaningful lives. Um, for one thing, every single company in the world is saying, oh, we better get into Nigeria. There are mouths to feed. There's money to be made. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a, it's a double edge. I, I would like us to ensure that we control that population. But in the short term, we are planning for it and preparing to be able to ensure that we can con have a, a country that is safe and peaceful and where children born can live full and meaningful lives. Yeah, I would just add to your question, a very good question. Most demographers think we're going to be at 10 billion people by the year 2050. We're about 7.3 billion right now. To meet the feeding needs of the extra 3 billion people, we will either have to find new ways to grow crops and to raise animals more efficiently, um, or we will face uh, famines, or we will face political instability that we've never seen, and some demographers believe we need to double the food supply from what we currently produce in order to meet that threat, because living standards are coming up. People aren't eating what they did 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. So it's a, it's a real global challenge, and Nigeria is the classic case study of this challenge. And, and that is going to raise questions of climate change. I, I'm using my crystal ball to think that Howard Frumkin is going to ask us something about climate change, but of course. How did you know? I just guessed. <laughs> so thanks both for great presentations. I wanted to pick up both on the climate change discussion and on, on Dan, on your comments about the need for science. Looking ahead 50 years, anticipating some of the climate-related threats to the food supply, diminished protein content, diminished work capacity on farmers' parts, and so on, what are the two or three questions that you would tell scientists we need to have answered? So well, make up the scientific research agenda for the next 50 well, <laughs> years. <laughs> will you give me a Nobel Peace Prize if I do this? Uh, okay, uh, no, Nobel, Nobel, that wrong guy. Anyway. Uh, uh, so, so I, I, first of all, it's a great question. One is we need to get, make sure we have adequate talent pool in the uh, study of these questions in food and agriculture. The National Academy of Sciences, by the way, I don't know if there are any scientists in the room. I assume there are some. They never had, they had a physics, medicine. They never had anything for food and agriculture until last year. They now have a, a separate award for people, sort of try to encourage more people to study the kinds of things that, that you are talking about in terms of n nutrient, much more nutrient improved crops, using far less water to produce crops. Um, there are you know, so many issues and questions here, including the issue of food, medicine, and health, which is not really studied very much. Uh, 
Um, the, the, the land grant college system, which I have great respect for, but it has largely been farmer production based over the last 50 or 60, 70 years. And it's logical, it grew out of the depression when we were really suffering. But we need to really expand our thinking about what is food, what is agriculture, and how it relates to our lives. And that means having way more people go into this field than we do now. Just uh, add, I, I also think we need to think about agriculture more as a business. And I went to some business schools and agriculture was not a focus at all. And in, Af in Africa, most of our agricultural schools don't have content on business. And m most of our business schools do not have any content on agriculture. And I think changing the mindset and looking at food systems and how they can be viable from a private sector perspective is so critical. So that's uh, it. We're out of time. And we have two international leaders. And how lucky that one of them is right here at the Aspen Institute. And the other is going to save the world. So thank you all for coming.